Listen to that rain. That's the sound of Edinburgh, falling on the just and the unjust. Tourists and street performers, sandstone and soot, the living and the dead. Edinburgh rain has character, running down venals, seeping into tenements, through the stone, down to the sea and back again. It has dripped from the victims and villains of this cramped, dirty, glorious city for generations. The downpour that soaked Deacon Brodie on the scaffold also drenched William Burke in his turn. It remembers everything. Its memories hang in the air we breathe. On a dreary October evening in 1908, it persisted over the hurrying figure of Mr Fergus Creeley, solicitor. His shoulders were hunched, collar up, hat pressed down on his head, but in truth, he barely noticed the weather. Fergus Creeley had committed a terrible deed. Rain mixed with sweat on his face. He muttered as he walked, not my fault, she wouldn't sell. She would have told, not my fault. How different from the man 12 hours ago, sat in his office, half listening as the spinster Mary Coulter asked his advice. About a bequest from her old mistress, a former client of Creeley's. A Bible. Very grateful, of course, but she couldn't read, and times were hard, and was it worth anything? He'd inspected it unenthusiastically. Plain brown leather. An odd blue mark on the back, frayed binding, poorly printed. A hundred years old, perhaps. He'd been about to return it when he'd noticed the inscription inside. This be the blood and body of William Burke, hanged in Edinburgh for his crimes. Professor Alexander Munro, 1829. The writing was in dark, faded red. The blue marking, he realised, was a tattoo. Burke's Bible. He'd stared at it for so long that Miss Coulter had asked if he was well. Burke's Bible. Infamous, lost, gruesome souvenir of the murdering grave robber inscribed with blood drawn during his public dissection, bound with his own skin. Rumoured, but never unearthed. How much would it fetch? A thousand pounds, maybe. More? And then a whispering, beguiling thought. Enough to repay your debts. Enough to start again. Slowly, Creeley had looked up at the old woman. He'd offered her two pounds. A good price to a woman of her meagre income. She'd hesitated. Five, he'd blurted. But his eagerness made her suspicious. No, sir. Thank you. No, sir. Then hours of cursing his luck, his blunder. That woman. A drink. Another. And then, then he was at her lodgings in a tiny, dark, sodden lane in the old town with 20 pounds, all the money he had. She would not sell. He'd pressed her. She'd shouted. And he'd only meant to cover her mouth to stop her shouting, but she'd fallen and hit her head. So much blood. And then she'd really screamed. And somehow his hands were around her throat. And then... A dreadful moment, and the book lying there. Fergus Creeley wasn't evil as such, but he was weak and selfish and greedy, and the difference is only that between fog and rain. It seemed unreal. H had it even happened? Had he... Oh, dear God! Had he picked the book up? He scrabbled in his coat pockets and pulled it out. Yes, unharmed, except for, he noticed with panic, a bright smear of blood on the cover. But even as he stared, the rain washed it away. <laughs>
Drops of watery blood fell to the ground. Some soaked into the leather. The sight of the book calmed him, and he looked up for the first time since leaving her lodgings. He was on the South Bridge. Newly installed electrical lighting shimmered in this desolate Edinburgh night. It was late and deserted, too cold and wet to be walking. Even carriages were scarce. But up ahead, he saw a figure standing under one of the lights, and he hid the book again. The figure waited. Creeley slowed. He couldn't make out its face. Uncertainty gripped him, but then he laughed as he realised it was just the shape of the rain under the lamp swaying in the wind. As he passed, the rain hissed. Poacher! Creeley's heart lurched as he spun around. Uh, Who's there? he called. He wished he'd had his cane with him. He peered nervously into the gloom. There was nothing. The light shone. Water poured around him. After a minute, he he continued. He passed Surgeon's Hall, then down a side street. No electric lights here, just the old hiss and sputter of gaslight. One of the globes was flickering. There was a figure waiting under it. Fear rose again in Creeley. Just mist, he told himself. Just, just fog, nothing more. And he shuffled towards it. Two paces. One. Nothing there. Then the dark lit drizzle moved and whispered, Thief! Ah! Creeley yelped and leapt back, and the shadow disappeared. This rain, this godforsaken rain... He carried on quickly. The soft gas lights ahead of him were like salvation. But the wind blew, and before he reached the nearest flame, it fluttered and went out. And knocks the boy who buys the beef, muttered a wet voice. Creeley ran, whimpering, lights flickering, and under every lamppost a watery shape reaching for him, endless, dark, dank, whispering shadows, and then... At last, the steps to his own house and the agonising delay as his key wouldn't fit the lock and the rain and steps behind him and the breath of something terrible. And then he was inside and slamming the door, leaning against it, panting, water dripping onto the floor. He stumbled into his study where the fire still burned and drank a tumbler of whisky in one gulp, poured another. He shed his soaked coat and collapsed into an armchair. Gradually, the terror left him. Whiskey warmed his blood. With trembling hands, he held the small book and smiled slowly. The rain spattered viciously against his window like handfuls of gravel, and slowly he became aware of a dripping sound, a leak above the lintel. Frowning, he put the book down and walked over to look. The fire hissed and went out, leaving him in darkness. And against the window, a shadow moved. Butcher! No! Stumbling back, Creeley's hand fell onto the book on the arm of his chair. It was drenched. Water poured out of it onto his hands, up his sleeves, his neck. Rain cascaded through the lintel and onto the floor, across his shoes, and the figure was there, in the room, wrapped around him. Thief! Rainwater covered his mouth. Heart failure, the doctor said. It explained the contortions and the expression on his face. Curiously, the housekeeper swore the body had been soaking wet when she found it. Water in the eyes and ears, the mouth full. Dr Hendricks was sceptical. Certainly it was dry when he arrived. Perhaps, he suggested tactfully, it drained away. Now, given the extent of Creeley's debts, there was little money to bury him just a pauper's grave with his few remaining possessions. 
a worn suit, a tarnished silver watch, and a small leather Bible found clutched in his hands to stay with him for eternity in the damp 